Hey everyone, welcome to Haydox. On this special two-part episode, I will be your guest host, Jordan Killian. In part one, we are getting to know the one and only Jill Allen. From her start into consulting to the logistics of services offered at JANA, we are covering it all. It's a peek behind the curtain I'm sure you won't want to miss. Let's jump in. By now, we all know I talk to a lot of doctors and give advice to practices in every stage of their life cycle. And one question my docs ask all the time is, who do you recommend for marketing to attract more new patients from the internet? My answer, easy. I have been recommending Mary Kay Miller and her team at Kaleidoscope for the better part of a decade. Why? They are thorough, professional, and transparent. Kaleidoscope Digital Marketing is who you want to talk to because they understand how to market in the orthodontic world and they offer tools that are affordable and easy to use. I'm telling you, if you're looking to step up your digital presence, Kaleidoscope should be your first call. Go to contactkl.com to request your free digital marketing consultation. That's contactkl.com. All right. This is an exciting episode. I think it's going to be really fun to record together and give the audience a little bit of a peek behind the curtain into you. I think it's something people want to hear, but they don't really get to hear very often. Yeah, this is going to be fun. Thanks, Jordan, for doing this. Yeah, let's get going. So to get started, I wanted to talk through the career etology of JANA. Can you tell the audience a little bit about your career trajectory what it took for you to actually start Jill Allen and Associates? Sure. So probably a lot of people don't know this, but when I got started in orthodontics, I actually started as a sterilization assistant to a way back when and made my way through the orthodontic office, learning all of the positions. And one of the really fun things about when I got into this industry was that I was able to work for some really progressive orthodontists who really believed in not only leaning in and teaching their team members about orthodontics, but also exposing them to consultants. So as I was making my way through the orthodontic office and I started as sterilization and then worked my way up into clinical and from clinical became a lead and a lead trainer and then on into treatment coordinating, I was also being exposed to what I'll say all the sages in our industry on the consulting realm. And as crazy as this sounds, I was one of those gals that was like, that is what I want to do. Like, I, I love everything orthodontics, but I love the business of orthodontics even more. And so I would keep a little notebook. I still have it to this day of how I thought that I would run a business. I would listen. I got exposure to some consultants and I'd take their ideas ideas and then be like, ooh, this would work really good in an office. And oh, I like this or that. And so that was my journey in the orthodontic uh, field. And for me, there was never a position that I just wanted to stick in because I love them all. And so I think that has really lent a lot to me in moving into the consulting realm is because what I saw is that every role in the orthodontic practice is really contingent upon another. And there used to be, I think, a a thought that one role was higher than another or one role was more important than another. And as I moved on in the industry and then started my business, what I believe is that Every role is important and you have to know how to do it all. And so when I got into the consulting business, that was something that I wanted to make sure is that I was not just specializing in one area, but able to really look at consulting as a whole for the business in every area of the orthodontic practice. So that's how I got into it and got started. And 18 years later, it's pretty fun. Oh, I love that. I love hearing that. And just how you moved through each position in an office. I think it, it gives people some hope into, hey, I can move through different positions in the office as well. And, and my career tra- trajectory in orthodontics is as far as I want it to go. Mm-hmm. And you can do whatever you want in this industry as long as you just have a mindset for growth and a mindset for learning. And I think that's really good for our listeners and our audience to hear. Yeah. So I'm wondering if we can take a look behind the curtain at the beginning of the business. What were your startup years like? Because 
everybody knows you as the startup expert, but nobody really sees you as a startup. So what did that look like for you when you were getting started? Yeah. And it's so interesting because for any docs out there listening who are doing a startup, the one thing I can say is I've got empathy for you because I, it doesn't matter what you're doing, any industry that you're in, when you choose to become an entrepreneur, And that really is what each of you are doing, is choosing to become an entrepreneur first. Your profession just happens to be orthodontics that you're going to be an entrepreneur on and in. That was me as well. And so when I got started in this industry, man, it was the hustle. Back when I was getting started, and for a lot of younger docs that are listening, maybe some of our senior docs will appreciate this. The internet was not a thing. We were, it was still just really coming into its own within our professions. We were still completely using charts. And the way we found out about other orthodontists was there was this big, almost like phone book of every single orthodontic practice in the United States. And so when I got started as a consultant, when I'm thinking, who am I? I'm just Jill Allen, who's got a passion for wanting to help help uh, doctors. I had to do all of the work. I would comb my way. And at the time I was living in Colorado, which I still live, but I thought, man, if I can just do some seminars on things that I know, maybe that's a good way for me to get my name out. So I would hand write out, I would hand write out all of these invitations and to to doctors in the Colorado metro area and come up with the topic. And I'd be like, for $50, you can come to my little conference and, and I'll teach you about HSA accounts or I'll teach you about insurance billing or I'll teach you about this, that, or the other. And it was really having to do the work. I can remember making my my little flyers on, I don't even know what the program was at this point because it was so old then, and having to print it out and being like, oh my gosh, am I going to have enough money to buy all the cartridges? to print out all of these flyers in color and make them look pretty so that people will pay me my $50 to come to my little seminar and just little things like that, that it took. And when, one of the things when I, a lot of people ask, Jill, how did you get into startups specifically? And that was, as I was entering into the consulting field, again, there was such a great sages out there. And I knew that I didn't want to compete against them. And I had an opportunity to work with a doctor who had come in deciding to be a partner in one of the senior doctor's practices that I had been in. And that partnership didn't come to fruition. And so he ended up buying a satellite practice of this senior doc. And I thought, gosh, this is my opportunity to really put all of my vision and thoughts into play. And so I made the decision to follow that doc. And we we started that practice and it was a two day a week practice, probably not even two day a week because it was a four day a, a month practice. And since then it's grown to be a multi-million dollar practice. And it was just fun to be able to see this doc who had great vision, but didn't have real clarity in how to run a business and get in there and and help them do that. As as far as the look behind the scenes, that's getting in there and helping that. That just really solidified what I saw as there just was not anybody that was really focusing on young docs coming out of school and helping doctors be business owners, really understand in the big picture of what it takes to get in and run a business. And of course, the times were changing a lot too, in the sense that Back in the early 90s, it was a very different landscape than what it is now. And even when I got into starting my consulting business, the times were really changing on how we were growing businesses and doing businesses. So that's that's some of that. I could go on and on about just all of the different things that I had to do as a consultant to make my way. But hustle, 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 a lot of grit is um, really what JANA is built on. <laughs> I love that. I think you saying grit, that that is the key word. That's the word that I kept thinking about the whole time that you were talking. Because I think not only did you build your business on grit, but you're also teaching all of your startup doctors that grit is what it takes. If you want to do it, don't play small, play gritty, get deep, 
go, you can do it. You can do it. You just have to push through the hard times and you have to think outside the box and it's going to be you getting your fingers dirty to get started. Yeah. And Jordan, one other thing that kind of comes to mind when you say that is, I think for all of us, when, when we are getting into business, into our own business, we really have to understand that rejection is part of it. And I think that's probably one of the biggest things that we all have to overcome is that when we're getting into it, you really don't have a reputation. You really don't, you haven't had a chance to prove your worth yet. And you're going out and putting yourself on the line. You're putting yourself out there, whether it's with an existing me trying to break my way into the industry or as a doctor trying to get out there and talk to maybe docs that you want to become your referring doctors within your network and them taking a chance on you. And I think, man, if I would have not persevered through that. And when I had so many people tell me, what are you doing? You've got this great job working in an office. Why in the world would you step away and take a chance on yourself? Why would you risk your husband's retirement money? Why would you risk being at home with your kids to do something crazy like this? And I always used to think, my husband and I, Doug, our, number one, our motto has always been, we'll figure it out. No matter what, we'll figure it out. And I truly believe that. And I also believe that God put me here for a reason. And if this wasn't the career or where I needed to be, he would close that door. And I was always open to that. If this door closes, I'm resilient, I'll make it. But I think just knowing that, that you can always do it and you just got to put your pride aside and go out there. And yeah, that, I think that is that, that grit component, but just going out there and saying, you know what? I, so that person doesn't believe in me. That's okay. There's going to be another one that does. And, and just building on that momentum. Yeah. I think some of what our audience might not know is that I'm your daughter. So for the <laughs> listeners guess. that didn't know, that's a try. <laughs> but I can actually remember those times. And even those times when you were starting to really get going in the business, but it hadn't picked up enough to where you could fully step away from some of the other things that you were doing. And you really were trying to burn the candle at both ends. You were working mm -hmm. constantly. You were making things fit where things didn't really fit. I can remember many a car ride in my career, starting in the orthodontic industry, just listening to you on phone calls with doctors and just getting to know kind of everything that you were doing in the industry. And one thing that I think stayed constant is you always had vision. You always had goals. But something that I don't think anybody really sees from you, I just got to see because I was your daughter, was that you also had the same nerves and hesitation that everybody else has when they're starting a business. So I'm wondering if you can share with the audience a little bit about some of your insecurities and how you pushed through those insecurities. And also, if you could go back to Jill that was just getting started and you could tell her one thing to keep her going or one thing that she would want to know that you know now that she didn't know then, what would that be? What would you tell Jill to keep her going and to, I think, just have that hindsight perspective. Sure. I would say probably in the beginning, the biggest thing that comes to mind, and I think every entrepreneur has this, is just this Im imposter syndrome. Like, who am I? I'm just Jill Allen. I, I'm just a gal from Golden that has a passion for the orthodontic industry and who's going to listen to me and who's going to trust these systems that I have put into place and who's going to, who's going to pay me money to, to do this. And, and it, it took a lot of years for me to get past that to be like, you know what? I can stand in my own space. I can own it just because I'm not a consultant that's been doing this for 15, 20 years, like some of the sages in our industry. I bring a lot to the table and I can own my space. And after working with doctor after doctor, I am able to show the results. And I think it always comes down to the proof is in the pudding, as cliche of a little phrase as that is. And I think that for me was just getting out of my head there. And again, I think that's what if every doctor were to think about it, that's 
ultimately what you're most afraid of, I think most of the time is why is a client going to choose me over somebody else? Why is a doctor going to choose to refer to me over somebody else? And why is this, that, or the other? Hey docs, let's talk about Smile Suite because it's not just another scheduling system. It's a game changer in the world of new patient management. And as a proud Smile Suite partner, I've witnessed the incredible impact it has on practices of all sizes. Smile Suite means your new patient calls and web leads are expertly handled seven days a week, even during nights and weekends. And they offer top-notch customizable presentation software and seamless post-consultation follow-up. It's like having a secret weapon for your practice's success. Curious? Dive into the revolution at GetSmileSuite.com. And don't forget to mention Hey Docs to unlock some extra goodies. Elevate your practice with Smile Suite because every smile deserves a suite of excellence. Hey Docs, let's talk about consumer experience for a minute, specifically the kind of experience where you purchase an item or a service that you've been excited about only to be let down or disappointed by the actual product or experience. Not a good way to start a relationship. That's why relationships are so highly valued at GC Orthodontics, because they are truly dedicated to the orthodontics specialty. GC Orthodontics is a leading provider of Tomy Orthodontic Appliances, quality products that have serviced the orthodontic community for well over 50 years. They are focused on providing total solutions that include both digital and analog orthodontic treatment modalities, like brackets, indirect bonding, and clear aligners. It's time to build a long-term relationship with a company that is dedicated to delivering total solutions to your practice. Visit GC Orthodontics at www.gcamerica.com forward slash Jill Allen and see why countless leading clinics have made the switch. And I think it's just because we haven't come into ourselves yet enough to truly believe that we are just as capable to own the space that we're in, whether we're an orthodontist opening up a new practice or a consultant choosing to step in and say, you know what, I've got something that's bigger than myself that I have to give to the industry. So that's, so that's for me how it got. I think the other thing that has always driven me, and I, I'm very thankful about this is I've never been told, even from a little girl, that I couldn't do something. And that was a big deal for me. Like I can remember, I have been an entrepreneurial spirit from <laughs> childhood. My mom, anybody who even remembers this company, my mom, I would say, I want to make some money. And she'd be like, here's an Amway bottle. Um, why don't you go up and down the street and see if anybody wants to buy Amway? I was like, not even a third grader selling Amway, you know, as unbelievably crazy as that sounds. Like I was like, sure, great. I'll, I'll, I'd be happy to do that. A fun, funny story just to tell you how my brain has always been is, and you probably remember this story, Jordan, but for the audience, when I was in junior high, again, I, I have always been about the business hustle from as long as I can remember. And way back, everybody who, who knows, I'm in my 50s now. So way back in the 80s, I was probably 70s at that point, but early 80s, there, was, there used to be these hard candy suckers that were really the rage way back in the day. Anybody from the 80s will know this. But anyways, and there was a gal that would sell me suckers for 25 cents and I would take my 20 bucks and go buy as many suckers as I could for 25 cents. And then I would go to the school and I was like the drug dealer on the corner, except for I was peddling suckers. I started off at 50 cents and I'm like, oh, these are easy to sell. So then I upped my game to 75 cents. And like I was bringing in a racket, buying them for 25 cents, selling them for 75 until I got caught by the principal. And I didn't know that I was doing anything wrong, but they were like, now, Miss Jill, you can't, they confiscated all of my little suckers, all my money making suckers. And, and then sure enough, then the school store started selling the suckers. So I'm like, number one, I had a good business idea. Number two, I was making great money and I got shut down by the man. No, just kidding. <laughs> but that, that just totally just for me throughout my entire life. And I've got after story of 
just constantly looking. It's just in my blood. I always joke with, with your dad, my husband, Doug, that business is my hobby. I love it. If any chance I get to talk to anybody about business, doesn't matter what it is, that's what I'm doing because it it's just in my blood. I love it. Every aspect of it doesn't matter which side of the business, the hard, the easy. I love it all. <laughs> I love that. I love that. So is there something that you could tell Jill from 15 years ago when the business was really just starting to take off and you were unsure of where it was going to go and where you'd be in 15 years from then? What would you tell her now? What would you go back and tell her? Surprisingly, it's probably the same thing I was telling her then is you'll figure it out. It, it'll work. You can do this. If this is where you're meant to be, it, it'll work out. And I luckily had a good internal voice at that point in my life that I said it then and I would continue to tell myself it now. If this is where I'm meant to be, the doors will stay open and you you will be successful. And there were many times where we had conversations like, what if you just had five clients? Oh, I don't think I could ever have five clients. Oh, what if you just had 10 clients? Oh, I don't know if I could ever have 10 clients. I can remember at one point having a conversation with the CPA and I had the smallest of smallest goals. If I could just make 50,000 off of this business, I would be. And I think that CPA looked at me like, are you nuts? Like, <laughs> why are you even here? That's nothing. But my goals were very small, but steady. And I think I would tell myself, if you're doing what you're meant to be, it's going to work out. Yeah, I think that's really awesome. So can you share with the audience what your why is? What is it for you? that makes this worth it? I think about this a lot because I just haven't got to the point where business is just business. And probably the thing for me is I truly love helping doctors and I love helping somebody else bring their dream to fruition. As corny as that sounds, I love helping them make it through and take something that's just a dream because I've lived it and then and then see and talk to my doctors you know I've been doing this 18 years now I've got docs that have made it all the way through startup to sell at this point and it is there is nothing more rewarding to me to be meeting with doctors and to have them say, Jill, I still use a lot of the same systems that are in place or them coming back and saying that really made such a big difference on how I did business going forward. So for me is I just, my why is I, I love helping people. I love meeting people where they're at and saying, Hey, you know, whether it's a team or a doctor and saying, Hey, you know what? It doesn't matter how we got here. If there's a problem, if we're working with an existing practice, because I don't just do startups, is but saying it's all right. Like we're gonna just come right alongside you. We're I'm not gonna beat you out over the head. Nobody wants that. I went. I experienced that in my career, and nobody needs that. It doesn't help anybody. And let's just figure it out and move forward. That, and I also think, and this is definitely more just a personal thing, but. I love our industry. And there was a time, and you remember this, where I even considered becoming a doctor because I really love our industry so much. And I honestly felt like I would have more of an impact as a consultant than as a doctor. And for me, just knowing that every new startup practice or every practice that we get to work with, I think just helps make our industry stronger. And I don't give in to the fear of DSOs and OSOs are going to take over our industry. There's a lot of incredible, amazing private practices out there and doctors that are doing it for the right reason. And so I've just always felt like every time I have that opportunity to put a little of my two cents worth into a practice and into a doctor and the way they treat their employees and the way they learn to do business, it just helps make our industry stronger. It's really good. You can feel your passion in every question that you answer. You can just feel the passion that's behind it. And I think that's inspiring for, I think it's easy to get burned out in anything, especially when you've been running your own business and there are hard things. Your doctors know it, you know it. So just to be able to feel even this far into the journey that you're just still so passionate about what you're doing in this industry, like I said, it's inspiring. So as we're switching gears a little bit with this episode, 
one of the stickers that we just created and one of the phrases that I've just started hearing you say more consistently is don't play small. And you tell that to your doctors and you tell that to your practices. You're talking to them about that when you're saying, hey, you can stand in your space. You can be who you're going to be. Your practice can grow as big as you want it to be. So what I want to ask is at this point in the journey of Jill Allen and Associates, would you say that you're still considering yourself that small startup business or do you think that you've outgrown that? Oh, such a good point. And this comes back to that imposter syndrome. At what point do you get past that? And for me, definitely, I have passed that stage. There was there was a point, again, where you're like, I don't even know where to set my prices because who's going to pay me X amount or this or that or whatever. And I can say definitely within for sure the last eight years or so, I definitely feel like mindset wise, definitely past that. But it's interesting because I think a lot of times in this industry, a lot of times the business is still associated with a startup business. And I think so many times people will go, oh, Jill does startups. So therefore, Jill Allen and Associates is a startup business. And Mm -hmm. it's funny now having 18 years behind me and to think I've been doing consulting longer than I was actually in the workforce of orthodontics. And I think to say, are we a startup business? Absolutely not. It's fun to look at it now and say, okay, yes, I have focused my business on startups. And now we've really brought into the fold acquisitions where we're really helping doctors because there's just as big of a need for a new doc coming in and purchasing a practice. A lot of times, Many of the doctors, just like a startup doc, they've never learned how to run a business. They may have been an associate for many years, but they never really got the behind the scenes. They don't know how to run a team. Having to be able to switch gears from helping doctors do startups to now acquisitions and helping them do all the things that it takes to transition them, especially if the senior doc isn't staying. And then now working a lot with existing practices. And this is an area that you've heard me say this and maybe other people have too, like, I love to work on the shoulders. I always say that startup acquisition, eight years to retirement, also working in that kind of mid midlife area. We just couldn't be a startup practice and be able to handle all of those different areas that we work in and in, in the business anymore. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. I know I told you that we weren't going to do a speed round. But I think that we should finish up this little part one (laughs) of of the Hey Don episode, this special episode with the speed round, because I don't know about our audience, but that's one of my favorite parts. I love to hear those little pieces of sage advice from the people that are guests on the show. And so I think that they'd love to hear that from you, too. So let's go for the speed round. Let's see if you can answer these questions. What is your go-to productivity tool? I use a lot of tools, but I would say I I am a Mac gal. I, I live on everything Mac. For me, my notepad is probably my go-to. If I have an idea, I'm always grabbing my phone and writing ideas. I've Gosh, I'm almost embarrassed to say how many. I think I have 300 notes on my notepad. And believe it or not, I use them all for different things. So that's probably like my quick down and dirty go-to. But then I have a lot of other programs, having a bigger team and just having to keep up with all the different things. I, I do use a lot of other ones too. But anything Mac that is a quick thing that just helps me to, between devices is my go-to. <laughs> Yeah, we got to love that ecosystem, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> it's all connected. Your phone, your watch, your Mac, it's all there whenever yep. you need it. Yep. I love that too. <laughs> so I know the answer to this. Our audience may not. Early bird or night owl, which do you think contributes more to your success? If you were asking me 20 years ago, it'd be a totally different answer. But I am now for sure an early bird. I, If I can get to bed, this is so embarrassing, before 9, and I'm usually up 5, 5.30 at the absolute latest. For me, the morning time is when I do a lot of creative things. And then also, just I just like getting my day started right that way. Yeah. 
<laughs> I love that. I would say I'm neither because I like to go to bed before 730 and I like to be up after seven. You're doing great. <laughs> what is the first job you ever had? My very first paid job, I was a a Baskin Robbins scooper. Man, I, I love that job. It was so much fun. We probably did everything that you don't want to know happens at a Baskin Robbins. I, I can remember we would have races down the aisles of ice cream with the mini scoopers to see who could get through the ice cream the fastest without a brain freeze. Baskin Robbins was my first official paid job. <laughs> I love that. I love that. And what would you say had the most tremendous? Again, I'm just, I love business. And I don't think that there is one particular thing. Again, I could say working for very progressive orthodontists that really believed in educating their teams and sharing education with them was huge because it showed me that there was more out there if, and the opportunity was mine if I wanted to take it. But I think for me, just over the years, I'm just, I love all things business. So any opportunity, I, I would be the person that if somebody's talking about business, I don't care if it was a dog walking business or if it were, I don't know, something in statistics. I'm like a moth to a flame. Just tell me all about it and tell me all about the business and all the things just because I love it. I just, it's so for me, I think the opportunity to talk to so many different people and so many different industries has been something that's just fueled me to continue to push for what I do. Yeah. And for our last question, what is one business skill you think everyone should have? I think the art of listening and communication is important, but I think being able to be still and listen is really key and listen not only with your ears, but with your eyes because you can learn so much about just being quiet and letting somebody else talk. You know, one of, that's probably one of my favorite things when I'm talking with people is to ask a question, then let them tell me. And it's so easy to want to be the smartest person in the room or the loudest person in the room. But if you can just learn to listen with your eyes, listen with your ears, I think that's a skill that everybody needs to maybe do a little bit more of. That is a very important skill. And it's something that's hard to learn. <laughs> it's not easy to be able to learn to be a good listener. So I think those are some good pieces of advice. I think that this episode is going to be one of the crowd favorites. I think that it's really exciting to get to hear your journey and maybe a softer side of Jill Allen that people don't necessarily get to see all the time. So thank you for joining us on this special episode. And I can't wait to get back with you for part two. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Jordan.